Good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Douglas Paul to BYU today. Uh, this week, on Monday, October the 10th, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 1911 revolution in China that toppled the Qing dynasty and established the Republic of China, which today continues to govern Taiwan as a democratic country. Um, it's time to have Douglas Paul speak today on Taiwan's democracy and politics and the implications of next year's elections in Taiwan on U.S.-China relations. Um, Douglas H. Paul is currently the Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. From 2002 until 2006, he was the U.S. Representative to, to Taiwan as the Director of the American Institute in Taiwan. Uh, the United States does not have official diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but we have a representative who uh, is the director of the American Institute in Taiwan, which functions as our ambassador to Taiwan. Uh, prior to that appointment, he served on the National Security Council staff of Presidents Ronald Reagan and Presidents George Herbert Walker Bush between 1986 and 1993 as the director of Asian Affairs and a special assistant to the president. Uh, Dr. Paul all, has also held positions on the policy planning staff of the State Department as a senior analyst for the CIA and at U.S. embassies in Singapore and Beijing. He has also worked in the private sector as a vice president at J.P. Morgan Chase International. Um, Dr. Paul speaks uh, both Chinese and Japanese. Um, he received a B.A. in, or they call it an A.B., or AB, in Chinese studies and Asian history from Brown University, and a PhD in history and East Asian languages from Harvard University. Please welcome Dr. Douglas Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out this afternoon to talk uh, about this subject with me. And thank you, Eric and Corey, for making it possible for me to make my first visit to Provo and to BYU. Our connection to BYU has been extensive over the years because we have had so many superb linguists come out of the various programs here and show up in Taiwan, China, and elsewhere in East Asia, in, uh, not just on missions, but later in their lives as they decide to try or, and even persist in careers in the U.S. government in various agencies and capacities. Um, I, I, we are here to mark the 100th anniversary, and I'm pleased to be told that a lot of you actually have some experience in Taiwan or knowledge of Taiwan, which makes it a lot easier to talk about a place which, while small in size, has been important in history and which is marking this important 100th anniversary. Um, but before I start launch into my comments, I wanted to make a little bit of a plug. Um, we at the Carnegie Endowment uh, try to get the best junior fellows in the country every year, and we think we do because we pay more than anybody else, and when the, when the acceptances come in and people see what we pay, they tend to go our way. In fact, my star right now is a, a young woman named Rachel Odell who had one year at BYU, and then someone told her she ought to try Harvard uh, to finish her degree, and she did, finishing number one in her class two years ago, and has now been producing terrific articles on Chinese foreign policy together with our senior associate, Michael Swain, and you can read some of those at what is now, I believe, the most uh, pertinent journal on Chinese affairs called the China Leadership Monitor, which is published online by the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. They publish three times a year, and they've got a, a stable of scholars who do really good work. And Rachel has been a major contributor to that, even though she's only two years out of undergraduate education. Now, beyond the advertising, and you can do all this application online if you want to do that. Um, I think it's worth taking time to look back a at a little bit of the history uh, of Taiwan and Taiwan-U.S. relations before we jump into the politics, um, because I think it adds some important context. Uh, as you should know, if you don't, to remind, uh, in 1895, Taiwan fell into the hands of the, uh, the Japanese after the Chinese Navy was defeated by the Japanese in an ill-conceived war, and Taiwan was the booty. Uh, Japan didn't do much with it in the first 25 years, uh, except to exploit available gold and coastal resources, some fish. It wasn't until uh, the, a Navy admiral from uh, Japan took over in 1918 and began to uh, drain the swamps, which were pestilential, 
in Taiwan uh, to uh, encourage cultivation of rice and rubber, other new crops uh, to settle some of the inland areas. Taiwan was a place divided between aboriginal populations of an Austro-Indonesian uh, background and coastal fishermen, from mostly from Fujian province in China, who had left the various periods of turmoil in China to take up mostly subsistence living on the Taiwan coast. The um, Japanese changed a lot of that. They introduced uh, hydroelectric sources of power and with that clean water, public education, and left a fairly good uh, record with the people of Taiwan for their administration. This is in sharp contrast, as is often pointed out, with the uh, army generals who were in charge of the Japanese occupation of Korea. In Korea, they discouraged public education. They put people to work in mines, uh, did not provide the amenities or opportunities that uh, Taiwan did th under Japanese administration. People say that navies are Im international by nature and armies are insular by nature. And they point to this contrast in examples to say that Japan has a very different impact on Taiwan politics and has <coughs> and led to a period from 1895 to 1945 where Taiwan was essentially a part of Imperial Japan and cut off from life on the mainland. So when we talk about a 100th anniversary of the Chinese Revolution in 1911, for the Taiwanese of that era, it was a, rem a remote or even an unknown event. The people on Taiwan were continuing to speak the Minnan dialect that came over from Fujian province, some local dialects. But increasingly through the education system, they were speaking Japanese, learning Japanese history, getting into Japanese business trade with Japan, expanding their various product lines, and, uh, and even serving in the Japanese armed services. Uh, this was all turned upside down in 1945 when after the Cairo Declaration and the end of the war, uh, Japan ceded Taiwan and the Pescador Islands between Taiwan and the mainland uh, back to China in the form of the government of Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic of China. Then the capital uh, was in Nanjing. As you, I'm sure, know well, there was a revolution and a civil war between 1945 and 1949. The end result was that Chiang Kai-shek uh, retreated to the islands. Uh, in the intervening period, there'd been a, a terrible massacre in Taiwan when some local people uh, rose up against uh, heavy-handed taxation and interference from uh, the newly arrived troops that had been sent to garrison Taiwan after the Republic of China regained Taiwan. Uh, they were seen as alien by the local people who had become essentially Japanese and Taiwanese in nature. And, <coughs> and this massacre seared itself into the memory of the people of Taiwan who were present then. This was followed by the retreat from China by Chiang Kai-shek's government and army mostly. Uh, it was maybe 15% of the population then and it's still about 15% of the population now. But they came in and took all the cream of the crop jobs and became overlords. A critical consideration in the period that followed was Chiang Kai-shek treated his time on Taiwan as a temporary encampment before he went back to the mainland. Fan Gong Da Lu, returned and, and counterattacked the mainland, was a theme that became kind of hackneyed and incredibly, uh, increasingly laughable as time passed. But it was something that Chiang Kai-shek, with his rock-ribbed character, uh, was determined to pursue. One of the consequences was that really infrastructure on the island was not very much developed because why would you develop your temporary encampment when your dream was to be back in Nanjing? So roads never got quite as developed, harbors never quite as developed as they should have been in the, in the many early years. And this created in Taiwan, uh, you know, as I think anybody would understand, a very deep resentment of the jackboot leadership of the mainlanders who came with Chiang Kai-shek. Whatever his personal virtues or non-corruption were, uh, there were plenty of corrupt people who have less than virtuous work styles around him, and they left a very bad impression on the Taiwanese people. A very good scholar of Taiwan politics, whom you may hear from later in the year, Shelley Rigger, uh, took advantage of uh, extensive polling by Zheng Zhidashe, uh, political universities 
uh, polling department over recent years, and then discovered very interesting strata in the population of Taiwan of people who had different experiences and what those different experiences meant for the way they look at politics and relations with China and the United States. Those people who had been fully up and, up and educated under the Japanese uh, have since then constituted the most uh, seriously pro-independence and anti-mainland uh, segment of the population. Those people who came to uh, adulthood under Chiang Kai-shek during the years of the Jack Boot control by the KMT also retained a very strong anti-mainland, anti-Chinese uh, views and strong pro-independence views. And, and a good example of that generation is the recent, uh, the last president of Taiwan, Chen Shui-bian, who uh, came up operating in the political shadows, trying to be with some of his colleagues a source of a new opposition party in a system where you could not rise within the government if you were Taiwanese. You had to be a mainlander or a mainlander poodle to, to move up. And the divide between those peoples is very strong. And this takes us to an, an, the next period in um, modern Taiwan history, which was after the United States uh, in the Vietnam War decided under President Nixon and Henry Kissinger that we needed to have a, a different relationship with China. The straws were in the wind that the U.S. was at some point, this year, next year, down the road, was going to de-recognize Taiwan and uh, recognize the PRC. Uh, Jiang Jingguo, the son of Jiang Kai-shek, who had mixed among the people in his, in his career, uh, who had been raised pretty well, his adult life was spent on the island and he had to mix with Taiwanese, saw that relying on the authority derived from a good relationship with the United States while pursuing a dictatorship at home was not going to be a lasting basis for legitimacy for his regime. And he, with a lot of foresight, saw that he needed to integrate the Taiwanese into the education, uh, into the political system, into the armed forces, and not keep a big divide between mainlanders and Taiwanese if it, the system was to survive. And secondly, he had to democratize. And there, was, there were lots of things coming at Taiwan. We had pressure from members of Congress, Steve Solars and Ted Kennedy and others were very active in promoting democracy there. But the, the real force of it came from within, and it was the really foresightful leadership, in my view, by Zhang Jingguo, that they needed to establish a new basis for legitimacy. And he began the experiment with elections, tolerating, if not legalizing, the existence of an outside party, a Dang Wai, uh, an opposition. Um, and over the course of the 1980s, gradually allowing more space for this kind of freedom of criticism and the like. Um, that gave Taiwan uh, the ability to, uh, the regime in Taiwan, the ability to survive through the derecognition of Taiwan that took place in 1978-79, when of course not just the United States exited formally, but most every country associated with the United States quickly lined up their relations with the PRC and cut off ties to Taiwan. Taiwan was benefited in that period because they had a particularly foresightful group of people who were technocrats running the economy. And they saw the Asian development model as uh, most clearly exemplified in Japan at the time as uh, the way to go. They persuaded the leadership in the country to support rapid industrialization and urbanization. They upgraded the infrastructure that Chiang Kai-shek had ignored, although plenty of room for improvement even today. And uh, they got Taiwan to the period of what's called Qi Fei, takeoff, where the economy really through the 1980s was an exemplary tiger economy of how to apply uh, capital to advanced levels of production to raise the people's incomes through higher productivity, to uh, create the right investment to re uh, environment for reinvestment in new capabilities and the like. And then ultimately, Jiang Jingguo gave the go-ahead for Taiwanese to seek retired military, retired officials, and ordinary people on Taiwan to uh, travel to the mainland to see what, uh, to visit old relatives, to, if they were mainlanders, to 
uh, look for opportunities if they were Taiwanese. I like telling the story of a particular friend of mine who was a very uh, successful Taiwanese businessman. When it comes to Taiwanese, there are Taiwanese who are, they could live anywhere in the world, they're happy to be in Taiwan, and there are Taiwanese who love the soil, hug the rocks, you know, embrace the trees, and this friend is one of those. He spends his time, when he has free time, to travel around the island and, and take pictures and look at the and look at the wonderful little spots tucked away in Taiwan. They're really physically beautiful. And enjoy the culture and live the language. He was the very first person on Taiwan to sign up to go to the mainland. Um, he, does, he had no intention of being a mainlander, be a citizen of the PRC, but he saw opportunity. And not only that, he saw opportunity that nobody else saw. He uh, is in the business of making children's clothes. And uh, he said, these people have a one-child ch policy on the mainland. The parents are going to buy a lot of clothes for that child. And they're going to buy good stuff. So he came back with the idea of opening up stores on the mainland in a couple of key cities when that was permitted after the early 1990s to uh, provide a market for his, his production. Today he has 440 banner stores around the PRC. And this little anecdote is intended to introduce the complexity of people's patriotic stance on Taiwan, the economic opportunity seen in China, and at an early phase, not where we are today. Well, that early phase grew through the 1990s, especially after 1992, and Taiwanese investment in the um, production chain to, to get what Taiwan was doing well, which was chip production on license uh, and other high-tech uh, things that didn't exist before 1988 into the, to the supply chain that would take it through Singapore and Malaysia where additional add-ons, dr uh, drives and packaging took place, and then final assembly on the mainland. And this momentum grew to the point where today the squishy figures that are closest to the official figures for just Taiwanese investment in the mainland is about $150 billion. U.S. investment in the mainland right now is $51 billion. We're pretty sure what the number is. The more likely figure is in the range of $300 billion Taiwanese dollars invested by 23 million people in a small segment of those 23 million in the mainland. So in economic integration has really taken place during this period of political evolution on the island. Now, um, the, the political evolution that was started by Jiang Jingguo had ups and downs. In 1978, he was going to authorize an election, and then the U.S. announced it was re resuming relations with the PRC. He decided that was too volatile a time to hold an election, and so he called off the election. That led to riots. The riots led to arrests, and the people who have been leading Taiwan for the last 15 years in the democratic opposition were all arrested and spent various amounts of time in jail, including for a short time President uh, Chen Shui-bian uh, prior to his uh, becoming president. Um, the ups and downs of the elections eventually uh, brought about uh, constitutional revisions in 1992, which got rid of institutions such as the old Congress, which had been elected last in 1948. And so a few of the members of that Congress were getting kind of old and unproductive um, uh, and unjustifiable. So that was, they were retired off and uh, some opportunities were opened up in the political system for more elections, culminating in the first truly democratic presidential and legislative election in Taiwan in 1996. And this introduces the PRC's reaction to all of this. In 1996, the um, um, PRC was worried that Li Dong Hui who was the vice president under Jiang Jingguo and had become president when Jiang Jingguo died in 1987. Um, uh, the, they were worried Li Donghui would take Taiwan in, on a path toward independence. He was native Taiwanese, brought up by Jiang Jingguo. Um, he had, there's a very complicated history which I would go into in Q&A if you want to, but he had migrated from being a faithful member of the Guomindang to being someone who was kind of breaking the harnesses and trying to, uh, give Taiwan more global in, um, independence, and who had notably come to uh, an alumni meeting of Cornell University graduates. He was a PhD in agricultural science from 
uh, did I say Columbia? Cornell. I meant Cornell. I, um, he uh, really irritated the Chinese when he did that. He, and then the Chinese were very angry at the U.S. for letting it happen. And they didn't want him to get reelected. And so they decided to put on a display of missile firing around Taiwan before the election. And this was wonderfully productive, in fact, so counterproductive that uh, uh, Lee was won by an improbable uh, vote of 55 to 45 in that election. And uh, China reacted later uh, after the election with yet another barrage of missiles which caused the U.S.-Taiwan uh, uh, confrontation where President Clinton was forced to send a couple carrier battle groups to the Taiwan area to sort of tell Ch China to cool it. And that also starts another story about military competition between the U.S. and China in that area. But we're sticking to the Taiwan story for now. Um, China then uh, in the, came to the 2000 election, four-year terms for president. Uh, Li Denghui was set stepping down. And Chen Shui-bian, who had been an outspoken advocate of independence, who had no tint of Guomindang KMT association, was uh, the stark choice, and because of splits in the, in the KMT, the uh, party, uh, uh, Chen Shui-bian actually won the election with only 39.7% of the vote, but more than the other two candidates could summon. And this caused another round of Chinese fulminations, which uh, uh, forced Chen Shui-bian, however radical he may have intended to be in the first year in office, he was very careful and moderate so as not to alienate his domestic voters and not to bring on unnecessary or you know, really costly pressure from China. China nonetheless put the screws to Chen Shui-bian and Taiwan at that time and, uh, and damaged its own uh, interests in the long run. That's when I turned up on the scene in, uh, in Taiwan and had to deal with a president who felt that the Chinese were his enemy and were thwarting him in every opportunity. And the U.S. was holding him down from doing what he really wanted to do, which was declare Taiwan independence. And, uh, and we had a, a very extended series of friction-filled dialogues for the next four years. The uh, frictions of the Chen Shui-bian period led the uh, uh, people of Taiwan at first to really rally because the PRC was so clumsy. But in 2002, new leadership came to the mainland. Hu Jintao, as general secretary of the party, had been left by his predecessor, Jiang Zemin, with orders that were developed in the aftermath of the confrontation with the U.S. over Taiwan's elections in 1996. That is, the U.S. sent two carrier battle groups, and China couldn't do anything about it. They didn't have the naval or missile or other capabilities. So according to what I know, Jiang Zemin told his military in 1997, I do not ever want to be without options again. I want options to respond to such pressure from the U.S. by 2007. And several sources have told me about this, but you won't find it in documents very easily. Um, but I believe it. So 2002, Jiang Zemin steps down, Hu Jintao comes in. Hu Jintao has launched a overall policy of trying to reduce the rapidly growing gap in the economy, in the, in the incomes of ordinary Chinese and the people of advanced China on the coast who have taken part in globalization. Um, harmonious society was the theme. He wanted to reduce tensions uh, and uh, make his own mark. But there, sitting in the middle of his desk, was this ticking time bomb of getting ready to go to war with the United States in 2007. And um, I, it, it's very hard to reconstruct from documents, but through conversations and other things over the years, it appears that Jiang, I mean, uh, Hu Jintao said, you know, these things are incompatible. Having a war with the U.S. in a prosperous country are problematic. So let's try to find another way out. And for six months after he came in, they authorized uh, Chinese scholars who were not officials but under in official influence to explore alternative paths to a relationship between China and the mainland. And in, um, after six months, the scholars came back and said, well, there are these several ideas out there. I was interviewed in Taipei by some of them, and I gave them some ideas that I'd heard from Taiwanese about how to improve relations. Um, then for the next six months, officials, diplomats, were authorized to ask people, what do you think would be good ideas? 
and uh, they, they were mulling over how to reduce tensions and get a more productive relationship. And at the end of that period, they came up with something, complicated process, but something called the anti-secession law, which was designed to look tough but be soft, i.e. protect yourself at home from people who accuse you of softening on a tough policy toward Taiwan and the United States, and at the same time get yourself to a more satisfactory trade and political outcome uh, with Taiwan. And the gap between what China was doing and where Chen Shui-bian was provoking grew more and more apparent as local elections kept taking place every six months or so in Taiwan, to the point where as in, by the fall of 2005, when there was a legislative election, you could really feel by talking to people in the island that an atmospheric change had occurred. And the people said, it's now time to stop costing ourselves in our relationship with China and take advantage of the opportunities in China. And this is not just mainlanders who would naturally feel that way, but Taiwanese businessmen, like that gentleman I mentioned who started the garment stores for kids all over the island, all over China. Um, this, is a, uh, this was a very subtle but a very powerful shift in political moods. We've had similar shifts here when people got sick of Bush in 06. We, we dumped on Clinton in 04, you know, these big national exhalations that happened and was happening in Taiwan. And Ma ying the current president of Taiwan, appeared in 2008 as the candidate to offer those voters looking for a moderate approach to the mainland a candidate of choice. Um, he won't go into all the details, but he ended up winning by 58% to 41-something uh, percent for his opponent, who was a, a, also a moderate figure but just didn't stand for as much, who was saddled with the baggage of his predecessor, Chen Shui-bian. And, and all the downsides of that. For the last three years, Ma ying has openly pursued a policy of, of conciliation with the mainland while trying to reserve protection of, China's, of Taiwan's status as a sovereign autonomous entity. And he lighted on a formula which has no true basis in history, but it's a very convenient fiction of history, something called the 1992 Consensus whereby in 1992, during a warming period between China and Taiwan, the authorities in the Guomindang Party and the counterparts in the mainland agreed that there was one China, but we have our different views about what that one China is. And that formula was revived by Ma ying in 2009 when he became president, excuse me, 2008 when he became president, and uh, has been the modus vivendi for cross-strait integration on the economic side, not on the political side. Uh, the hallmark of that was this past uh, 2010 agreement called the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, ECFA, which in Taiwanese has a certain good sound, pronounced that way, as producing prosperity. Um, the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement is widely recognized to be uh, almost completely one-sidedly in the favor of Taiwanese business people trying to get access to the China market. There's been grumbling on the Chinese side that it's an unequal agreement. But the leaders in China decided they wanted to try to pick off constituencies in Taiwan who have been skeptical or hostile to China and give them economic reasons to draw closer to China over time. It's a long-term strategy. It's not meant to get instant results, at least under the current leadership in China. Um, but it's one where the um, uh, lawyers in Taiwan was, were largely Taiwanese who could not be in the government, well-educated people, and they gravitated around the Democratic Progressive Opposition Party in opposition. The physicians were a similar class of people, professors or another, where you, you couldn't rise in the government, but you wanted to be a professional, you'd go in these professions. China made very nice offers. If you're a doctor fully licensed in Taiwan, you can open clinics in China. So for example, one very significant politician, the DPP, he happens to, he's, not, he's a nephrologist, he runs kidney dialysis machine clinics in Taiwan, a couple of them. He's now got six in China that he couldn't have before the Chinese made this allowance. allowance. Um, legal practice, students going back and forth, trying to, China's very wisely, shrewdly, trying to win over constituencies to a more constructive relationship. But that's been going on and it's been thickening relations. Um, we could go in, you know, the economies have been going up and down. World economy has not been good. 
people around China are doing a little better because China's doing a little better for reasons that are both good and bad. Um, the result is that Ma ying is now going into an election this January where he's got to defend a record. He promised greater growth than he could deliver because he promised it before the, the global crash. But he's producing more growth than anybody else has been able to produce in his neighborhood. So he's got bragging rights. Unemployment was high, but very high by Taiwan standards. It's now down a lot, but it's not down to where he said he would do it, uh, get it in uh, his 2008 campaign. Um, so it's kind of a mixed picture on economic performance, probably not too bad for the incumbent to get reelected. Um, Tsai Ing-wen, his opponent, uh, a lady lawyer educated in the US and Britain who um, has been involved in cross-strait relations in the past and has been a later rival at the Democratic Progressive Party, joined in 2001, but has uh, won the primary process, which was very strange uh, in Taiwan this year. And she is now the quite articulate spokesman for the DPP. And she is trying to articulate a difference from Mob by, by saying the economic growth may be there, but it's not what he promised, not good enough. The Gini coefficient, the gap between the ordinary people and the, and the wealthy elites who are profiting from business on China is, great, is growing too great. Uh, social injustice is therefore a result. She promises to fix social injustice and to bring the wage gaps into line and to handle cross-strait relations with the mainland with greater dignity and more effectiveness and greater skill and professionalism than she says Ma has done. Ma has, uh, on, has had a couple of stumbles in terms of administration. He's sort of turned to his premier to do things that the premier didn't do. He was hit by misfortune. They had a typhoon that dropped it's hard to imagine, seven feet of rain in 24 hours in the southern portion of the island. Mountains melted away. And, but he wasn't there to watch it, and so people criticized him for letting it happen. And, uh, and, and he got this, an impression grew that he was not an effective administrator, and his, his polls for positives uh, polled where most Japanese prime ministers of the last five years have polled, down around 20 percent. or. He's come back a lot. He's now up in the 30s. Uh, and he's a little bit ahead of Tsai Ing-wen in the current polls. Polls in Taiwan, you have to judge very carefully. They're, un they're not, the best of them are not necessarily reliable, and a lot of them are highly partisan. Uh, but the, if you aggregate them and you use some judgment about past poll results, you can see that Ma has got a bit of a lead. And uh, Tsai Ing-wen uh, is, is struggling, has been losing a little ground lately. Um, in my view, she's got a fundamental problem, which is that 39.7% of the vote that elected Chen Shui-bian represents those generations, the older generation, the middle generation, it's there obviously some younger people too, who constitute a 40% voting block in Taiwan who will vote for the DPP, whether it's a dog, a cat, a human, or anything else, because they don't want to ever vote for a mainlander or a KMT person. And they're, they're irreducible almost. You could discourage them from voting, but generally speaking, they're highly motivated voters. Um, the problem is you need more than that if it's a two-person race to win the election. And this is the dilemma that Tsai Ing-wen has faced, which is how to expand her vote into what are called, in Chinese, the central voters, which we would call them independent voters, people who are neither KMT nor DPP but want to see effective government. And what she's having trouble doing is saying, how she will deal with the mainland in a way that wins the 10% who've got some stake in business with the mainland, and at the same time hang on to the 40% who want nothing to do with the mainland. And it's a contradiction. If she moves toward the center, she loses some of her green, her deep fundamental base support. And if she moves to the fundamental base, she scares off the center. And she has not yet bridged the challenges caused by that dilemma. She has three more months. The election is January 14. Uh, if she happens to get elected, her positions will probably evoke considerable grumbling from Beijing and discomfort in Washington because we will be uncomfortable with someone who is not ready to handle cross-strait affairs effectively. And that came out during a recent visit she made to Washington where um, officials said they stood neutral in the election but on background said they had problems with her performance in Washington. If she is elected, the four months between inauguration and, excuse me, between election and inauguration 
um, will be ones of intense diplomacy as people try to persuade her to take a position different from the one she's taken up to now. Um, as I say, it's a close race, and one thing we've learned in Taiwan is there are lots of volatility in the election. Um, the KMT claims the election was stolen in 2004 when a bullet was fired at President Chen Shui-bian. And uh, in 2010, we had big municipal elections in Taiwan, and a bullet was fired at the son of uh, the former party chairman, Lian Zhang, uh, and hit him in the face, you know, major damage. Um, and that, the election then the next day went 60% to the KMT when they had expected the DPP would win 60%. So even though there's a marginal lead for Ma today, uh, the, um, the chances of, uh, of something volatile happening and adjusting that at the last minute are not to be dismissed. And the final, and uh, my final comment is to say that after all of this very interesting history, which so few people pay attention to, um, I remain pretty cautiously optimistic that the practicality of the people of Taiwan, who are islanders, who have to make do, they don't have any natural resources, it's all what they do by wit, uh, will continue to serve them well, and they will find ways of preventing relations with China from coming to a point where they sacrifice everything for some principle, and yet retain enough flexibility to stand proud for what they are as Taiwanese. And the U.S., I'm confident, will uh, remain behind that. There's a lot of debate that's appearing recently about whether the U.S. should abandon Taiwan at, at the strongest, or moderated support and deference to Chinese interests, or somehow avoid a conflict with China over Taiwan. Um, this is an issue where American fundamental values are concerned are at stake. And if you're not a person interested in values and democracy, where American interests as a leader in the the Western Pacific are at stake. Abandonment of a good friend and long-standing partner would not do us well with our other friends and partners in the region, Korea, Japan, or Southeast Asia. Uh, for that reason alone, we would be most reluctant to um, reduce our commitment to the security, stability, prosperity, and economic political development of the people on Taiwan. And that's where we are after 100 years. I look forward to your questions and, and uh, exchange of views. Thank you. Clearly not a junior fellow applicant. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Benjamin Hayford. I'm studying Asian studies with a business management minor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you talked about kind of Beijing's potential reaction to tying one winning and Washington's potential reaction. But what about your potential reaction? Can we hear about that, please? Well, I, I'm not an official, but I still have to live in the world of, uh, of Taiwan politics and, and uh, the, I, I wrote a piece recently, which you can find online at, at uh, Carnegie or in a lot of other places, um, and it was about the multiple dilemmas we face. And I, I, was, I tried to encapsulate the dilemma faced by Taiwan in that the DPP wants to have the voters who come from cross-strait relationship point of view, and they want to have the fundamentalists, and they have to solve that problem. And they also want to have good relations when they get in government with the PRC. The the, the thing that's missing in the DPP formula is how to address the one China policy. Um, Taiwan's position is we believe in one China, i.e. Taiwan, this is the Republic of China, and we acknowledge that each side has its own way of expressing that. And China says it has the one China principle and it accepts the consensus that there are different views on the two sides of the Taiwan Strait about what that account amounts to. That language, fuzzy as it is, allows the PRC to make, to do such things as welcome ministers of the Taiwan government as members of delegations to conduct negotiations in China. They're not called provincial leaders, they're not made to kowtow, they come in as, as uh, partners in this enterprise. If the one China formula is taken out, that becomes impossible. It's like taking the weft out of your fabric, you know. That's what allows China to do this. Otherwise, any Chinese official meeting with them would be uh, 
subjected to criticism from the masses and from government officials for having sold out China's interests. And the same applies on Taiwan. If you give too much to one China, then the people say you're sacrificing Taiwan's uh, sovereignty and autonomy uh, in the interest of some deal with the mainland, and that's uh, beneath Taiwan's interests. And it, during the first half of this year, the Taiwan officials, excuse me, the mainland officials responsible for Taiwan, Wang Yi, Chen Yunlin, and others, have been sending signals that, look, we know you have a problem, Ms. Tsai, with one China. Can you find a formula? So they changed it from being the 92 consensus only or one China policy only. And they said, try to find a one China framework. You find the language that somehow, and this had been done by Chen Shui Bian in, 19, in 2001. He referred to a future one China. And I, my own guess is that probably would have been acceptable to the mainland if she put that in her platform. But it clearly wasn't acceptable to her party. And so she, she's, She's missing something that's critical to managing cross-strait relations. And that's what American officials identified when she visited Washington. And I saw it too in my private meeting with her, that uh, she was no different in private meetings than she was in official meetings. I'm not trying to suggest there was a difference. Uh, and and that, that's where the dilemma lies. And it, it puts us in a dilemma because we don't want to get involved in this election. We really do believe they have a democratic system that's working and it will produce wise results in the long run but we can't help but express reservations that if we have a round of severe tensions between Taiwan and China, it's gonna drag us in because we're the security guarantor, and that's gonna get in the way of global financial reform, managing North Korea, managing Iran, a host of others, let alone the South China Sea, which is borders on unmanageable right now. Um, so we don't think we need this extra problem in a, in a tough period. And we would hope that she could find a way uh, to, to seize upon the flexibility shown by the, the PRC to bring both constituencies that she's trying to unite together. And so far, she hasn't been able to do that. Hi, my name is Aaron Day, and I'm a history major here at BYU. Uh, my question to you is, do you believe that the People's Republic of China will be successful in their plan to retrofit old Russian aircraft carriers and ultimately build their own? Yeah. And do you view that as a threat to U.S. Uh, naval supremacy in the South China Sea? Um, again, if you go to the Carnegie website, I have a piece called The Chinese Are Coming, The Chinese Are Coming. Um, I'm, uh, this talk of the Varyags refitting as a Chinese carrier uh, reminded me of the old movie uh, with Alan Alda where uh, Russian sailors end up on a uh, Massachusetts island and get very confused, and people got very panicked. Uh, and we're, we'll probably have some panic when the ship starts sailing around the South China Sea. It will give, once it's made operational, and so far the operations have been, I mean, they have one operational ep episode, extremely limited duration, immediately into dry dock, so something may not have gone perfectly. Um, and, uh, and anybody who's trying to operate aircraft carriers has to go through years of learning and uh, training of pilots and how to use these things. Uh, but once it's up and running, and, they, and if they choose to put it in the South China Sea, where China cannot sustain air cover over its claimed territories, they will, for the first time, be able to sustain air cover over that. And it will make a difference to everybody in Southeast Asia who's got a claim. Of course, we will be around, and others are, are adding to their inventories of capabilities very rapidly in the aftermath of the last two years of tensions over the South China Sea. Down the road, we expect this Varyag was just a training episode. They're gonna, they've already laid two hulls for two, two keels for two new carriers, we're told. Haven't seen them yet, but we're told. Um, expect that to happen. There's going to be a piece of the, you know, the, the, the reputation that comes from having a carrier force that they just can't resist. It's, it's a mark, it's a prestigious uh, development. And it is absolutely no problem for our military to take it out if it has to. Um, China has a rapidly growing uh, submarine force. They're building four submarines a year. One has to wonder whether they have the welders and the capabilities and the engineers to design and build four safe submarines a year. Uh, there are tremendous numbers of vulnerabilities in the, in the Chinese military arsenal. You very seldom read about that. You always read about the capabilities that China's building up. Um, their, their underlying uh, weaknesses are well known. Um, the American Navy, Admiral Willard out of PACOM, has very wisely um, 
uh, begun a process of greater presence in the region in anticipation that when that first Chinese aircraft carrier shows up, it'll have an outsized psychological impact on people who've never seen one before. And, um, and we need to remind people that we're still there and that we feel we can deal with a threat that might emerge. Thanks, Aaron. I know your witching hour has come to get to another class, but I'm happy to stay on for a little while. I was just thinking, I'm Jason Tippetts. I'm a graduate student in second language teaching, Mandarin focus. And I was just thinking about um, like McDonald's and how a economic system can be linked with, I guess, culture so much. And, and you know, that's a Western thing. And so um, with Taiwan and China, for example, HTC in Taiwan, are those, is that company succeeding in China? And, and you mentioned your friend who has clothing stores. And, um, and not on a political level, but just people, you know, getting visas and traveling between. I know that there's, you hear stories about tourists from China visiting Taiwan. And, and how much is that, that side opening up? Well, um, I guess one emblematic number is there are now 584 flights a, day, a week between Taiwan cities and mainland cities. Um, the, it's visa-free now. The Chinese are asked in the election period to uh, constrain the numbers because they, they don't want rambling Chinese tourists to somehow get caught up in Taiwan's elections. And the PRC shares that view and is constraining the numbers at the moment. But generally speaking, there's been a, an explosion of visits. The, the explosion of visits from Taiwan to the mainland happened years ago. The new story is when I was in Taiwan, um, they had pitiful tourist numbers. It was, you know, people were all going to the mainland. Taiwan has the greatest Chinese art collection in the world in the National Palace Museum, and yet they had less than a million tourists a year coming to Taiwan, which is way underperforming Hong Kong, Thailand, Singapore, who have 15, 20, 25 million tourists a year. With the opening of the mainland, this numbers have been zooming up, and it's been a big boost to the tourist industry. Last week, Ma announced they're going to double the size of the National Palace Museum to handle the, the throngs that are, that are coming in there. Um, the uh, Taiwan companies, by and large, have been doing better than anybody else on the mainland. Um, they don't have the same restrictions on practices that American or British firms have, in, and uh, they also are more comfortable in the culture there's a big thing that's hard to quantify that's important and sort of sustains consultancies of people who know how to do it, and that is how to negotiate to a successful conclusion with a Chinese firm, you know, how to read the signals. And all. Taiwanese are better equipped than anybody to do that, and they've been doing it. Hong Kongers are also well equipped. Um, so I th most of their firms are doing well. Problem is, the last since 2005, uh, China has gone into a counter-reform in the financial services, uh, financial sector generally. Um, the the Jurongji reforms of 94 through 2002 uh, have uh, stalled and been reversed in many cases. There's an excellent new book on this subject called Red Capitalism by Carl Walter and another man whose last name is Howie, H-O-W-I-E. Forget his first name. Um, but it, it, it chronicles this uh, regression. And with that regression has come an increased amount of corruption within the Communist Party and their affiliated uh, businesses. The cost of doing business now in China, I'm told by reliable people, is about 20% for entertainment. Not 20% of profits, not 20% of, of, it's 20% of the business goes to entertainment. And that's essentially corruption. Uh, and so China knows it has to deal with this, and it faces a major dilemma. Again, on Carnegie's website, I've posted a piece looking at the coming uh, few years in China. And, and the short take on it is uh, we're, at Carnegie, we're trying to get the message out that the decline of the U.S. has been way overstated. And you won't see that this year or the next three or four years, but we'll be back, and I can show you why. And that the rise of China is being way overstated. Uh, China is using the same transformation model that Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and others, Malaysia and Thailand have used. And it's great for a while until it isn't. And the moment is coming when it isn't. And we're seeing it now with cities in Western China that have been built without occupants. 
Someday there will be occupants in that, but meanwhile, a lot of money will be lost. Those will become non-performing loans put on the bank books. The bank books will take them, the banks will take those and hide them as zombie loans the way the Japanese did all through the, the mid-1990s when they, they came to the end of their developmental model of free capital available to politicians to give to entrepreneurial friends, to get paid back by the entrepreneurial friends, and then to build things. When you're, the first phase of building their people to occupy those buildings and use those roads. You get to a later phase, you get roads to nowhere, cities that no one wants to live in, and the model collapses. That model is not gonna collapse this year or next year. And I suspect next year there's gonna be actually a, a liquidity boom because they're having a party congress and they always fill the economy with money to make everybody happy for a party congress. The following year, the new leadership, Xi Jinping and company, have to consolidate their rule and uh, they won't be taking away the punch bowl quite yet, but come 2014, 2015, they're gonna have some challenges I think they're not prepared to meet. Uh, they, intellectually, they know they're coming, but the problem is the party system is local cadres take free money from the laboring masses and give it to favored friends. The favored friends build things. Westerners come and say, wow, look at that airport, look at that road. They've really wowed us and then they don't make money. There's no return on these investments. And so you've got to hide all the bad debts. And, and then you can't give them free money anymore because the bad debts have overwhelmed the available capital. And the model comes to a stop. And the question is, if, can the Chinese system, which has made massive changes successfully in the last 30 years with some bumps in the road, uh, can they make this change, which is gonna go right to the heart of how the party operates? I think they can. Do I think they will? I'm not so sure. Anything about, nobody wants to talk about Indonesia, Thailand, the rest of the <laughs> Um, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, legisla legislatively, we have a requirement to provide uh, arms to Taiwan. President Obama has sold 12, about $12 billion in the 11 plus, yeah. Um, and this always causes a big controversy. And recently, we made a, a five plus billion commitment to sell arms. What is your general, there has been some talk about maybe this process of selling arms to Taiwan and angering China's is may, maybe should be thought about and changed. Some people will say that, you know, we couldn't sell Taiwan enough arms to defend itself in mainland China. So we're just simply creating problems by selling arms to China. But yet we have a uh, legal obligation and a, a long-term moral obligation to help defend a democracy. How does the United States itself work through that arms sales dilemma? In, in the bottom line is I don't think we have a choice. We're gonna do it. And uh, it, not just for moral, but for strategic reasons. Um, a longer version of my thoughts, but not the longest, is in the summer edition of Foreign Affairs, where I responded to Charles Glazer from George Washington University, who is a pure IR, IR type, who not knowing Taiwan and China said, IR theory says you cut off Taiwan support in exchange for a better relationship with China, and that ought to be a negotiable deal. And I tried to explain in my article that that is not a negotiable deal. Yes, Taiwan and China might get to a point where they say, let's disarm our confrontation across the Taiwan Strait. Let's channel it into confidence building measures and the like. But the U.S. can't take the lead in that. It would be terrible for our international credibility. It would uh, undermine the morale on the island immediately. Uh, and that is important because that morale, that sense of self-confidence is what allows Taiwan to take the risk of opening relations and having 584 flights going back and forth. Uh, there are 23 million people next to 1.3 billion. They can't run an arms competition with the mainland. You can't put enough steel on the island to match what China can put on their coast. And so it has to be a mixture of adequate deterrent capabilities, which can't be just left, you know, Maginot lines left untended for 50 years. We're gonna have to provide equipment to help them keep what they've got in good shape and upgrade and, and move into new areas where necessary not to be able to launch an attack on the mainland, but to pose a credible deterrence, a high enough cost to cause the PRC to stop and think. Most of the people who get into theories about how, why we should dump Taiwan are talking about, well, if the US gets into a war with the mainland, 
it's bad for the whole world and we ought to you know, excise this tumor so it doesn't infect our bigger relationship. And the like. These things are manageable. Experienced people can handle it uh, based, on, uh, well, based on their experience and on the, on the calculation that China is not as strong as people assume at the outset of making these arguments. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending time with me. Nice to be with you.